We're going to be revisiting August of 1982 today, so I suggest that you listen to Eye of the Tiger by Survivor, or maybe watch Rocky III to get yourself in the proper mood. In August of 1982, Commodore developed the Commodore 64. This machine almost immediately became a worldwide success, and it is in fact known today by the Guinness Book of World Records as the highest selling single computer model of all time, selling somewhere between 12 and a half to 17 million units. Like most computers of the era, it used a version of BASIC developed by Microsoft. And according to Wikipedia, the CEO of Commodore, Jack Tramiel, turned down Bill Gates' offer of a $3 per unit fee, stating, I'm already married, and would no pay no more than $25,000 for a perpetual license. And if you consider that the Commodore sold more than 13 million units, this may be one of the best business decisions that Commodore made, and perhaps one of the worst that Microsoft made. In fact, this computer is so popular that today, more than 33 years after it was originally released, and 22 years after it was discontinued, it is still being used in demo competitions around the world, This computer only ran at 1 megahertz compared to our 3 to 4 gigahertz computer systems today. It was arguably somewhere on the order of probably 10,000 times slower than a modern computer. It is perhaps because of this that the computer still retains an interest with hobbyists who keep wanting to see what they can make the hardware do. Now the Commodore 64 is one computer that I grew up with and my skills never came anywhere close to those of the demo coders that you just saw. In fact, I mostly just knew BASIC, and occasionally I would reference some guide that told me how to do things like changing the background color of the screen. And now we have made the border color white. And we could change this to say zero, and that's interesting, or we can take a peek at this value and see that it is 240, which might be confusing to us because we just clearly set it to zero. If we change it back to, let's say, three and peek it, we see that it's 243. That is because the Commodore could only support 16 colors, so only the last four bits of this value are actually used to determine the background border color. So to me, as a kid doing this, I just thought that this was some secret command that you typed in. Fortunately, with the documentation that we have available on the internet today, we can learn basically anything that we could ever possibly want to know about the Commodore 64. And in fact, there is so much documentation about it available that people have completely re-implemented their own new Commodore 64s from scratch, such as the C64 Direct 2 TV. It is a joystick that contains a complete re-implementation of the Commodore 64 in a single chip that was custom designed by Jerry Ellsworth. This is an impressive piece of work and it was actually designed to be hackable if you happen to find one for yourself and are interested in electronics hacking you can expand it to be essentially a full Commodore 64. So with that in mind we'll see that we actually have accessibility to the complete schematics of how the hardware for the Commodore 64 was designed such as this schematic here which is the second page of our drawing, but it shows all of the relevant information. What we're going to specifically concern ourselves with 
is the VIC chip, the 6567, which is responsible for all of the graphics generation. So the fundamental question that we want to answer for ourselves right now is why in the world does the command poke 53280,1 set the border color of the Commodore 64 to white? Let's start by looking at what the value 53280 is. This is a 16-bit number, or can be represented in 16 bits. So we have our 16 blocks. And each of the bits in our binary number here represent a different value. This is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048. You can see a pattern here, it doubles each time. And that makes this 4096. And this is 8192. And this is 16,384. And this is 32,768. So our number, 53,280, is equal to 1, 1. So that is 53,280 minus 32,768. Four thousand one hundred twenty eight left over, so that fits nicely into our four thousand ninety six bit and now we have thirty two left over, and that gives us this bit, and we have zero left over, so we know the rest of these bits are all zero. And for the sake of working with this hardware, it's going to be convenient to convert this into hexadecimal. So we've got four sets of four bits here, here, and here. So this is 0, 2, 0. And this is the value 13, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D. So we see that D is our 13th value. So we have just decoded that this is our hexadecimal number D020. Okay, so now we have all the information that we need in place. We've got what our hexadecimal representation is, and we've got what our binary representation is. And the binary representation of this one, now, this is an 8 bit number. We know that because the Commodore 64 is an 8-bit machine and it has a 16-bit address bus. So 1 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay. So why does this matter? We are telling the computer that we want to write to the memory address specified here the value specified here. So now we're going to move to our schematics of the hardware to see what that means. So we have our schematics in front of us now. And let's write out what our address lines are. So we've got address lines A15, through A0.
and we have our data lines D7 through D0. And this is because everything is zero counted in the computer world for the most part. All right, so we know from our previous calculation that we've got a 1, a 1, a 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And we are setting the value 1. Now, this information is electrically directly represented in the circuit of the hardware while the computer is executing. So we can see these values, A12, A11 here, these are all address lines and they are all going to be represented in these values that we have specified. So what we are concerning ourselves with today is the VIC. We are concerning ourselves with this piece of hardware right here. And we want to know a couple of things. How does the information get to it? How does this chip know that it's supposed to be receiving information from us? And you'll see here is a pin called CS. And that CS has a bar over it, which is difficult to see on the video but it looks like this. That means if that value is not high, then the chip is enabled, and this is called the chip select pin. So let's trace this chip select pin, and we see here it is labeled VIC, and it also has a bar over it. So we know that this is enabled if the value is not on. And that comes to this chip here, U15, which is a decoder. And this decoder takes in two address lines. So our decoder is using A11 and A10. And we know that A11 and A10 are both zero. And because they are both zero, we know that the zeroth output is going to be disabled on our decoder. So this, in, this disables or sends to ground the VIC signal, which means that this is going to turn on our VIC chip. Now we've got A11 and A10 worked out, but then we're stuck with the question of how does this chip know that it should be enabled? And right here is another enable pin called EN bar. And that is tied to this line called IO. And this is now our IO bar. And we know that that again means that we are doing something IO related if this value is not active, because it has the bar over it. So now we have to make an inference, because this piece of hardware, U17, is a PLA. It's a programmable logic array. And exactly how it was programmed is something that this schematic doesn't tell us, nor does looking up the chip specification tell us, because it could have been programmed to whatever the manufacturer wanted to be programmed to. But we see that address lines A12, A13, A14, and A15, which are up here, come into this PLA to determine what function is going on in the computer hardware at this exact moment. So what we can infer is if 15 and 14 are high, and 12 is high, but 13 is not, then we are in I.O. mode. And this enables the I.O. chip that we were just looking at. And the I.O. chip controls whether or not 
we are talking to the color ROM, color RAM that is, which is this chip, or the VIC, which we've already discussed, or it can also enable the SID, which is the sound output chip that we have not talked about at all yet. And this kind of thing is uh, very normal in how computers operated in the 80s. They would attach the peripherals directly to the memory bus, and by selecting different address lines, different address values, so the uh, CPU says, I want to write to this particular value, and then the CPU, as far as it knows, its job is done. It's saying, I'm writing a value out to this address. And the hardware does all this decoding and logic work for us to say, OK, we're going to enable the VIC because that's what the user wanted. And we are going to send the data to it. And there is actually another pin here called RW. And this read-write pin becomes enabled, and the VIC knows I am being told to read a value. So it gets the value because it has been enabled by these higher order bits, 10 through 15. And then somewhere in here is the command that we're telling it, which apparently the command for 20 hexadecimal is to say, set your background border color. And then the data lines pick this up, the VIC stores the value internally, and it does its job. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out my other channels, subscribe, and leave a comment below.